great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to worship God, to sing some praises to Him, and to have an opportunity to study with one another. I've gotten into the practice of every once in a while wearing a bow tie. That way I can brag to all my friends that I say I was the best looking guy at church wearing a bow tie. And as I was setting out everything to be ready for church today, last night, Samuel says, I want to wear a bow tie too. He says, to ruin everything. No, I can't say I was the best looking guy at church today wearing a bow tie. But nevertheless, I guess we'll go ahead and make it through this lesson. My spirits aren't dampened too much, I guess. I've been excited about this series we've been doing on Sunday mornings. And uh, last Sunday night, we actually did another one of the part of the series that I wanted to, uh, for us to go ahead and touch on then. I've been excited about this series. It, it was our I Life series. Because during this series, we've looked at the Christian's life and been trying to find a way to intentionally live as a Christian. Now, that can be difficult. It can be difficult because this society that we live in, like all the others that have been in times past, is not geared towards Christianity as it once did. It used to be, a couple hundred years ago, in this country, it wasn't all that difficult to live a fairly Christian lifestyle because the majority of people in our area were predominantly Christian. But even then it was difficult because so much of the world, even when they claim to do right and do good, don't really succeed all the way. So it's still difficult. But throughout this series, we've been looking at a way for us and ways in different areas of our life, on different subjects, for us to live as Jesus would have us to live and act as Jesus would have us to act in different areas of our life. We've looked at first the fact that we have to die. The title of that lesson was I Die. Because if we don't die in a spiritual sense, in our uh, bear and be buried with Christ in baptism, we can't have a Christian lifestyle. You can't have a Christian lifestyle without becoming a Christian. And you can't be joined to Christ unless you die with him and are baptized into his death. That's Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and following. Then we looked at specifically how to worship God. And I say specifically. Because we didn't look at the different acts of worship like as we participated in this morning and singing praises to God and praying. We didn't look at that. We looked at how the entire Christian life should be one giant sacrifice given in worship to God. And this morning, we're going to kind of follow the same thought of these beginning principles that we need to have in order to worship God, in order to praise God, in order to live a Christian lifestyle. It has to involve love. You cannot be a part of Christ and not have love in your life. A Christian lifestyle is a lifestyle filled with love, with compassion, with care. If you will turn over to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, this is going to be our primary text for this morning's lesson. John chapter 13. 34 and 35. While you're turning over there, let me kind of set the scene here. Jesus has been a part of the Last Supper, as we know it, the Passover Supper. And during this Passover Supper, at the beginning of the Supper, something happened that doesn't usually happen the way this did. Something happened here that was very, very different. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Now, it was common at that time, especially, to have your feet washed. After all, most of them wore sandals, the roads were dusty, there wasn't this nice pavement we have out here. Your feet got dirty. And they didn't have a table and chairs as the kind that we have today. Their tables were low to the ground, and they reclined at the table, possibly leaning on one arm with their feet stretched out in front of them. And when they were doing this, you would have one person laying like this way, and another person would be right up next to you. That's why we see the, the pictures of Abraham's bosom, somebody leaning up against your breast. That was the person that was very close to you, and you were able to have an intimate conversation with them. But the other problem with this way of eating, and this style of eating, is that your feet would be close to someone else's face while they were eating. And walking on these dusty, dirty roads, that wasn't exactly appetizing. 
So here you have Jesus washing his disciples' feet. As I said before, this was common, but it was common to have a servant do this. This wasn't a glamorous job. In fact, when Jesus comes to Peter, Peter says, you're not washing my feet, Lord. It was almost disgraceful. It was disgraceful. To have your Lord, your master, wash your feet? Surely you wouldn't allow them to do that. But Jesus didn't follow conventional things, did he? He was teaching a lesson. He taught the lesson that they were to go out and do likewise. That if they wanted to be great, that they had to be servants. They had to have a servant's heart. That you couldn't be somebody as a Christian unless you were willing to serve with love and compassion. That leads us into John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. You will follow along in that with me. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Thank you for following along in that with me. If you don't get anything else out of our lesson this morning, if there's nothing else in here that you remember, that you take home with you, remember these three things. First, Jesus gave them a new commandment. He gave them something new for them to follow. And as Jews, this meant a lot to them. They, they were used to commandments. In fact, they had a list. And we're not talking about the Ten Commandments. That's a very basic, boiled down version of the law. They had a specific list of do's, a specific list of don'ts that they had taken out of the first five books of the Old Testament. And second, then he called them to love one another as they had been loved. And we'll talk more about that when we get to it. Third and finally, we're going to talk about our Christian ID. What are you known for? What should a Christian be known for? First, back to this new commandment. As I said before, to a Jew, this would set off bright, flashing lights. A new commandment? Another rule we need to follow? Something else I need to add to the list of things that I've already been doing? They would have been excited to hear this commandment. All right. They like commandments. They're used to those. But what was this new commandment that they were given? They were commanded to love one another. Now, the first question that might be asked is, do I have to, and the list could go on and on, do I really have to do this? Do I have to do it every day? Is it something that I have to put all my heart into? Can I just can I do this outward expression of things that need to be done? You might first ask, do I have to actually obey this? Is this something that I really have to do? Right after this, in John chapter 14, and verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What was this new commandment that he had just given them? This new commandment was that they would love one another, just as Jesus loved them. If you love Jesus, you've got to do what he wants you to do. If you love Jesus... If you want to display that love for him, you have to actually act like you love him. What an amazing thought. So do I have to actually do this? Is there some people that it's okay for me not to love? Is there some people that, that's just really asking way too much for me to show love and kindness towards them? Well, if you love Jesus, you're going to obey his commandments. You're going to do what he tells you to do. Second, do I have to do this? Do I have to love the least of them? Isn't it okay for there to be some people that they just really don't deserve my love? There's some people that God doesn't really expect me to love them, does He? Look over at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to look at verses 31 through 46. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Here Jesus tells a parable. A parable that you are no doubt familiar with. And in this parable, he's talking about the final judgment and painting us a scene. In fact, that parable may not be the best description 
He's just painting us a scene of what it's going to be like on Judgment Day. And he goes through these interactions that he's going to have. Verse 31 says, When the Son of Man comes in glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. That was Paul's for a moment. What kind of list of people is this? Is this the social elite? These are the people that are in prison. These are the people that don't have clothes. He didn't say don't have a full closet of clothes. It said doesn't have clothing. These are the people that don't have food to eat. We're not talking about people that are hungry. Think third world for a moment. Think about a third world country where they would love to have a small morsel of bread. The people in prison. The people that don't have any clothing. The people that don't have anything to eat. The people that really need to be taken care of here. What does he say? You took care of them. You did that. Notice the response here. Verse 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers. You did it to me. Do I have to do this to those that are the least? Isn't there a cutoff line? Somebody that after a certain point doesn't deserve my love, compassion, kindness anymore? Isn't there someone, if they're in prison, surely God doesn't expect me to visit them, does he? If they're so sick, surely after a certain point, I can just give up on that individual. It's not what Jesus said. He says, as you did to the least of these, and you did it to me. Well, that's nice. But what if you don't? He wouldn't really hold you accountable for that, would he? Let's keep on reading here. Verse 21, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? If they would have seen Jesus, they would have helped. If they had seen Jesus hungry, they certainly would have given him a morsel of bread. If they had seen Jesus needing somewhere to stay for the night, they would have taken him in. But they didn't see Jesus. They saw the least of these five brothers, as Jesus described them. And that was his response. Then he will answer them, saying, in verse 45, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So surely, do I have to help the least? Isn't there a cutoff line? There's not. This new commandment Jesus gives doesn't have boundaries. There's not a group of people that you can't help. There's not a group of people that are outside the limits of God's love. There's not a group of people that God doesn't care about. And as God loves, what did Jesus say again? That we're to love one another as he has loved us. And Jesus loved in the heavens. Jesus loved the woman of Samaria, the woman that rested that she was hated. Jesus loved the prostitutes. Jesus loved the drug addicted. Jesus still loves all those people. Do I have to? Do I have to obey? Do I actually have to love them? Do I have to love even the least of them? 
about the lost? Surely this is only talking about Christians, right? I mean, for another Christian, at least then I can stomach it up and help them. Mark chapter 6 and verse 34. Jesus is looking out at a group of people who were lost. He describes them as being lost like sheep without a shepherd. How did he feel about it? Let's read Mark chapter 6, verse 34. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. These were people that were lost. Like sheep out in the middle of a field with no shepherd, no one to protect them, no one to guide them, no one to tell them where to go, no one to teach them. And what did he feel? Did he feel anger? You silly people, how come you haven't found someone to shepherd you yet? That's not what he said. Was he upset? Angry? No, he felt compassion on him. He was a loving person. He cared. <coughs> Even for those that were wandering out in the middle of the field without a shepherd. Even for those who were the least. He cared. What motivates someone to love like that? Well, God is God. And God is love. We well, read about that in 1 John. That's just who He is. That's His identity. He made us. He's our Father. Love that a Father has for His children is the only example that we can give to possibly describe this, but it doesn't even compare. God didn't just father us. He created us. He made us. He made us this entire world, gave us everything, even free will. Why would I love someone the way Jesus is asking me to? Well, we answered the question a moment ago because Jesus did. It's His love that motivates our love. Look we'll over in Romans chapter 5, 6 through 8. You see, we're not just talking about a guy who gave people fish and bread. Jesus wasn't just a fellow who handed out something to pacify him for a time and then went on after that. No. He had a deeper love than that. He didn't just give them what they needed to be satisfied right now. He provided for something much more great. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What do you do? Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? I'm going to read one more time. Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. <coughs> Though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why would I love even the least? Why would I love those people that don't deserve it? That don't earn it? Why would I love those sorry good for nothings? Why would I love those people who are the scum of the earth? Because Christ died for them. And if nothing else in their life gives them worth, that does. If the image they were created in, the God, doesn't give them worth, that does. If they have never accomplished one decent thing in their life, if they are the most ungodly of the ungodly, laziest person you've ever met, Christ died for them. He cared about them. Not after they had cleaned themselves up, but while they were still in their sins. a pretty good reason to love somebody. That's a pretty good reason to show somebody love and compassion, even when you don't think they deserve it. Because you didn't deserve it either. You didn't deserve Christ having grace and mercy on you. I didn't deserve it having grace and mercy on me. He left this example for us. That's exactly the way it's worked in Ephesians 5, chapter 1 and 2. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. When Paul is teaching the church at Ephesus, how they should live, how they should walk. He tells them to walk in love, to walk in life, to walk in wisdom. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate God as children who are loved. And what's he say right after that? And walk in love as 
Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. What kind of children do we walk down as? Children who are loved are to walk in love. And we are loved. That's what he's saying. Why would I walk in love? Because God loves me. Imitate him. Reflect that love that he shines down on you out to everyone else around you. Unconditionally. Completely. Totally. No boundaries. No limits. Why? Would I? <coughs> How much does God love us? Jesus loved us enough to die for us, even when we're in our sins. He gave us an example of love. But He wants to demonstrate to us just how intimate a relationship that He has with us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Paul says, If you were way better than I could. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, not her in the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Church, you're the bride of Christ. How much does he love you? He married you. He chose you and only you for all eternity. He died for you. He gave up himself for you. There's no greater show of love that God can compare this to. There's no deeper understanding of love that we could have than when two come together and become one person in marriage. It's a beautiful picture. And it's that picture that others are supposed to see in us. If I had not e-tag here, and it said, Jacob Cecil, what would it have under that? What's my job? What's the description of what I do? Or as another example, let's say on my tombstone. Sometimes it'll have the name, it'll have the date, the birth, date, death, and maybe a little epitaph, something there that's said. What would be said about me? How would my life be described? What would be my description? Is it Jacob? That guy was strict. He strictly adhered exactly to what God wanted him to do. He was known for towing the line. Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 and 13. Let's see what Jesus had to say about that. Are we supposed to be known for our strict adherence to the truth, to the doctrine? Is that what people are supposed to think of when they hear a Christian? Matthew 9. Verse 12. But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. You may not have realized before. He's not talking about sick people here like we might think. When he says that the physician didn't come to seek the healthy, He's not talking about the physically healthy. He's talking about spiritual things. He clues you in on that at the end of the verse. The Son of Man didn't come to seek the righteous, but the lost, the unrighteous, the ungodly. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not a sacrifice. He desires mercy and compassion, not strict adherence. That's what's more important. Here are these people looking down on who Jesus is ministering to. What does he say again? Those who are well don't need a physician. People who are well don't think they need Jesus. People who think they got their life under control have no need of Jesus, of a Savior. So am I supposed to be known for my strictness? No, that's not what Christians are supposed to be known for. What about our strict adherence to traditions? Keeping the traditions of our fathers, of the church. There's usually great pride given to 
this congregation was established in so and so year. We've been doing the same thing for this long. If you look at any company, they'll say, our traditions are firm. We stand firm. Is that what Christians are supposed to be known as? We're just as strong as we were in the first century. Practicing the same way. Doing the same old thing. Staying strong. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat? He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father or mother. So for the sake of your, your tradition, you may avoid the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He's describing here a practice that the Pharisees promoted of instead of honoring, and by honoring, taking care of their father and mother, they'd say, The money that I was going to use to take care of you, I gave that to God, so you can't get mad at me for not giving it to you. Now, they probably spent it on other things, but that was the excuse they gave. I gave that particular $20 bill I was going to give to you, I gave that to God. I can't very well ask it back from God. It was lying, it was deceitful, and it was wrong. But that's not the point Jesus is making. He said, why do you value your traditions more than the truth about God? That's not what's important. Strict adherence to doctrines, not what's important. Keeping with the traditions of great religious leaders is not important. So what is it? What is it that's so important? What am I supposed to be known as? Is it your love? Your kindness? Your compassion? Is that what we're supposed to be known for? Now, we've kind of already cheated that because the text already said that. They should know you by your love. Well, let's just pretend we haven't read that yet. Over in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, an amazing statement, I've mentioned it before, has been, was made. Peter is preaching to Cornelius and his household. And he assumes they've heard about Jesus. He assumes they've heard about Jesus' life and the word has gotten over there, which it undoubtedly has. But in passing, he mentions in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healed all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. If there was something written on Jesus' tombstone, what would it have been? The Son of God, the great Messiah, the Christ, the powerful, the Almighty, the just, the righteous. When Paul had to surmise his life, he said he went about doing good. Isn't that a great thing to have on your tombstone? Here lies Joe Swalk. He went about doing good. Here lies Jacob Cecil. He went about doing good. I only wish I could be worthy of such a time. But Jesus was. Jesus loved that much. When his life was described, it was described by love. That's what he wanted for us. He wanted people to know us by our love. Our love for our fellow man. I want to leave you with a question this morning. We've talked about what we ought to know for. We've talked about why we should love the way that God has loved us. But ultimately, all of that is going to be meaningless when it comes to you and your life. If you can't answer this question truthfully, honestly, and make an informed decision based on that. For what do you know? For what do you know? Are you the good guy, but you don't have Jesus? It's pointless. 
Are you the guy that gives out a lot of money to people who need it? But you don't have Jesus as pointless. Are you the guy that picks up hitchhikers when they need it? It's pointless. Are you the lady that will take cards and food to those who are sick? But don't have Jesus as pointless. Are you the lady that sits with people at the nursing home, encourages them, and is there for them, but doesn't have Jesus? It's pointless. It's all pointless. Now, Jesus, what are you known for? Perhaps we don't fit into that first group of descriptions he gave. Maybe that's not how you know it. Maybe you'd be known as Jacob, the sinner. <coughs> Maybe you'd be known as Jacob, the guy who cares more about football than anything else. Jacob, the guy that loves to cry. Like that's me. What are you known for? This morning, regardless of what else you do in your life, let there be one thing that stands out. Let there be one thing that above all else you are known for. Let it be what Jesus wanted. Let his people be known by their love for one another. This morning, if you want to make a decision, Give your life over to God. That's amazing. If you want to decide to die so that you'll have eternal life, there was nothing that would make us more happy. There was nothing that could make the angels rejoice in heaven any louder than to see someone deciding to become a Christian. And this morning, if you're here and you are a Christian, but you're not very Christ-like, don't let that discourage you. Welcome to the club. We're a group of people that are trying all the time to be more and more like Jesus. But that doesn't mean it's okay to stay where you are. Take this opportunity this morning to grow in your relationship with Jesus. To decide to love more like Jesus wanted you to love. To live more the way that Jesus wants you to live. If you'd like to make that decision, come right now. Let us pray for you while together we stand and sing.